What is up everybody, it's Mr. E here for another episode of Mr. E Science. Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to go through the third uh, part of my revision series on motion. This is part of the mechanics topic. What I've done is I've now created the playlist, so I've got these in the same order as the chapter of the book. The book that I'm using, if you haven't uh, got this, if you're not part of uh, the science course where I'm a teacher, um, it is the Edexcel ASA level. Uh, physics textbook published by Pearson uh, Education International and it's by Miles Hudson. You can pick that up from Amazon, in fact I'll pop a link down below, there will be an affiliate link uh, where you can pick up that book. Um, it's a pretty good book, uh, we use it uh, quite regularly. The questions in here um, are the ones that I'm going to refer to, uh, I'm going to give you a link to the questions. Uh, I am going to do a video uh, where I am going to answer the questions and go through them all uh, one by one as well. If at any point you do have any questions for me, please, please, please do leave a comment down below and let me know what else you want to see on this channel. I'm going to be doing some Key Stage 3 science stuff and I'm going to be doing some Key Stage 4 science and hopefully some fun experiments that we can do at home. Let me know what kind of thing you want me to do uh, and I will prioritise those and get those done. All right, so let's just jump straight into the physics then. Uh, we're going to look today at the four equations of motion. Uh, we use these when we're performing calculations, projectiles and any moving objects. We use them when we are looking at objects which are constantly accelerating. And we have to look at these uh, one, two, three, four uh, vector quantities and one scalar quantity. And these are displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time. Now these are denoted by their uh, symbols, and we have S for displacement. We can't use D uh, because D means a million other things. It gets confused with distance, uh, which is a scalar quantity. So we use S for displacement, which is a vector quantity. U and V are our velocities. V, the traditional velocity, uh, stands for the final velocity. U comes before V in the alphabet, so that is the initial velocity. It's as simple as that. These are both vector quantities. And acceleration. This is the rate of change of velocity, which is given by uh, the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by time taken. Time is our only scalar quantity here, and that's in seconds. Displacement in meters. Uh, the velocities in meters per second, acceleration meters per second per second, time in seconds. Uh, the vector quantities uh, always be positive in one direction and negative in the other. This gives them direction and magnitude. We are going to look at two dimensional problems and we're going to resolve forces and resolve uh, ve the velocity vector problems, uh, but we need to know. Uh, what direction they are going in. So we arbitrarily assign uh, one as positive and one as negative. All right, now you don't really need to be able to derive the SUVAT equations, but I think it's really useful to know where they're coming from. I've seen a lot of uh, students uh, really struggle with the SUVAT equations, and really it's because they haven't really thought about how they're derived, where they come from, and what they actually are, and what they're trying to tell you. So let's have a quick look at this. Uh, derivation of SUVAT. If you think about a simple uh, equation with no acceleration, the velocity is given as displacement divided by time. And so we can rewrite that, rearrange it to be displacement is given by velocity times time. This is nothing new so far, uh, this is simple uh, mechanics. And we can look at uh, acceleration. Acceleration is given as the rate of change of velocity. That's the final velocity, v minus the initial velocity, u, divided by the time taken uh, for that acceleration. So we can rearrange this. Um, it's not that hard of a uh, rearrangement. Uh, you multiply both sides by t to get at equals v minus u. You move the u on to the other side, and you end up with velocity. Uh, final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus acceleration times time. That could, shouldn't come as too much of a shock to you. Um, if you start a ball rolling at zero and you measure the time it takes, you know it's acceleration, you've essentially calculated its final velocity. If you launch something with initial velocity 
of I don't know 100 meters per second and you measure its acceleration over time you know its final velocity now the super equations do calculate the motion of objects but we need them to be under constant acceleration so most of the problems that we're looking at are under constant acceleration either the acceleration is zero or it has one finite constant value we're not looking at things that change acceleration that becomes very complicated so this means that the average velocity uh, of the situations that we're looking at is always the final velocity uh, and the initial velocity added together and divided by two to get the average velocity if acceleration is zero then you just add the two velocities together which are the same divided by two you get the same velocity okay so you've got displacement it's velocity times time average velocity given by u plus v over two multiplied by the time so we've looked at some relatively simple equations now now we're going to uh, expand them by substituting these equations into one another if you're following along uh, you'll be able to see uh, that we can easily slot uh, these equations together if you're not following along and you're not entirely sure what's going on go back a step and go through them slowly try and derive them at the same time as me or slightly ahead of me um, and the best thing to do after that is have a go at the worked examples we're doing later and then try and get an understanding of what it is that we're doing right so we've taken the uh, equation s equals uv u plus v over 2 times t and then we've substituted for v equal to u plus a t so now we've got this equation uh, there's a bracket missing there i do apologize u plus u plus a t close bracket divided by 2 times t and this will give you when you uh, work it all out uh, 2ut plus 80 squared divided by 2 uh, you get rid of the 2 and give a half on the at side and that gives you displacement is equal to ut plus a half at squared all right now we can also with a little bit of derivation of the previous one uh, say that the time is equal to twice the displacement divided by u plus v and this is from the uh, average velocity uh, equation we looked at before and again we can say that v equals u plus a t this is where it gets a little bit trickier rearranging we then or substituting rather we have v equals to u plus a 2s over u plus v what i've done there is i've taken v equals u plus at substituted t for 2s over u plus v if you multiply that out you've now got v multiplied by u plus v is equal to u into u plus v plus 2as okay and again you multiply out the brackets you've got uv plus v squared is u squared plus uv plus 2as got uv's on either side you just cancel them off it ends up with v squared plus u squared plus 2as now these are a lot of equations i said there were only four so what we're looking at now let's look at the actual equations themselves we have s for displacement u for initial velocity v for vinyl velocity a for acceleration and t for time here are the magic four equations and you can see by looking at these equations uh, that each of them are missing one of the terms at least one of the terms v plus equals u plus at there's no uh, displacement in there whatsoever so if you don't know the displacement you can calculate uh, stuff anyway um, s equals ut plus a half at has no final velocity in there v squared equals u squared plus 2 as has no relationship to time so you don't need to know the time to work that out and then s equals u plus v over 2 multiplied by t there is no acceleration in there at all so we've got this set of four equations that will help us calculate these five parameters and we can rearrange them in any way we suit uh, to uh, calculate these five parameters so to apply these and we call them SUVAT equations because they use those uh, um, symbols 
we list all the variables that we know. Anytime you have a SUVAT equation, always, always, always write SUVAT down your page and then put right next to them the uh, quantities that you know. If you know displacement, pop displacement in there. Okay. Then you know which variables are missing. The SUVAT equations are on your data sheet. And then you can look up, well, hang on, I don't have this uh, one. I can use this equation. Uh, before we're doing that, we have to assume uh, a couple of things. The horizontal motion and the vertical motion act independently. Now, if you are not entirely familiar with this and you've never seen this before, I'm going to stick a link uh, down below in the, in the description section to this video, Monkey and the Hunter Problem. Uh, the video that uh, I've got in mind uh, is pretty cool. Uh, you've got um, a bunch of physicists on a stage uh, performing to a bunch of school children. That sounds like a large hall full of school children. And the one guy, it's obviously part of a larger presentation, says, we've been uh, dealing with little guns and things. Let's bring out a cannon. And the kids obviously roar. He brings out a cannon, proceeds to hoist up one of his physicist colleagues uh, on a pulley and uh, essentially shoots him with a cannon um, and of course misses. Uh, he aims directly at him with a, a laser pointer but because uh, of gravity uh, acting on the bullet, the bullet curves towards the center of gravity of the earth and completely misses the guy. Then what they do is they set up an electromagnetic system and as soon as the, the one physicist fires the cannon, the pulley on the other uh, physicist who's suspended over this stage uh, releases and he drops, he falls to uh, the ground, falls to the stage. Now because the horizontal and vertical motions are independent of each other, acceleration due to gravity is the same. Gravitational field strength is still 9.81 meters per second per second. So this means that as the guy is falling, he's got a, uh, a catcher's mitt, as he's falling, he's falling at the same rate of, as the bullet or the, or the ball, or the cannonball. So he falls down and he is able to catch the ball in midair because his height and the height of the projectile are exactly the same at the point they meet. And it always will be. It doesn't matter how far away the cannon is from uh, the guy. It will always meet that projectile if it's aimed uh, directly at him. So a falling object has to have a vertical acceleration of minus 9.81 meters per second per second, and that's a gravitational field strength of Earth. Uh, when you throw something up in the air, it's gonna reach a peak height. It's got a vertical velocity now of zero meters per second, and then it's gonna fall again with a negative velocity. So these are arbitrary um, direction points down uh, or towards the center of the Earth. It's gonna be thought of as negative. OK, so we have our four equations of motion. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at a particular question and we're going to use the assumptions on the previous sheet. So we're going to be um, looking at a question where something is just acting in the vertical direction. So you've got to list all of the variables in the vertical direction and then use those assumptions that uh, something when it reaches its peak it is at zero uh, meters per second and that the acceleration is negative 9.81 meters per second. So here is our practice question. Shep the sheepdog leaps two meters into the air. What was his initial, his launch, velocity? Okay. So the first thing we do is we write SUVAT down the side of our page and we list out the things that we know. We know that the displacement is two meters. That's what it says in the question. He's leapt two meters into the air. We've assumed this is the peak. The initial velocity, we don't know. That's what we're trying to work out. So we put a question mark in there. The velocity at the peak, we know from our assumptions, is zero. The acceleration, we know he's uh, being affected by the gravitational field strength of the Earth. So it's negative 9.81 meters per second. There is no time in the uh, question. We don't know what the time is. We never will know what the time is uh, unless we work it out from something else. So we now have to select the equation that has no time involved. So we look at our four equations, V equals U plus AT. Nope, that's no good. 
S equals UT, but no, that's immediately no good. Uh, v squared equals U squared plus 2AS. Yes, that doesn't have any time involved, so we choose this one. Uh, there are two things you can do now. You can either uh, rearrange for U, uh, which in this case is quite difficult because it's uh, got its squares involved, or uh, you can substitute all the numbers in, work everything else out, and then rearrange at the end. This is the difference between the Ursao method and the SRAO method. Uh, I will talk about these in another video um, if you haven't heard me talk about them before. Essentially, Ursao, equation, rearrange, substitute, answer in units. Uh, SRAO is equation, substitute, rearrange, answer units. Two slightly subtle uh, differences uh, in the all right, so in this one, we're going to s row. We're just going to substitute all of our numbers in. V is 0, so we've got 0 squared equals u squared plus uh, 2 times acceleration, 9.81, multiplied by our displacement, which is 2. This gives us uh, 0 equals u squared minus 39.24, meaning that u squared is 39.24, giving you to be 6.26 meters per second. Okay, so when we apply uh, see that, for example, in this projectiles question, uh, we're gonna look at projectiles in a moment, but let's think about all of the little SUVAT uh, foibles. Number one, everything in the vertical direction with the final velocity is zero meters per second at the peak uh, of the um, motion. Uh, it reaches zero, and then it's going to decrease again uh, and fall towards the ground. Uh, the acceleration at any point in the vertical direction is nine, minus 9.81 meters per second per second. That's due to the effects of gravity. Uh, the initial velocity can be calculated by F sine uh, A, where A is the angle uh, that uh, something is launched from. And again, we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. In the horizontal direction, the acceleration we're going to assume is always zero, unless you're told otherwise. Uh, the acceleration in the horizontal direction, um, normally, uh, unless it's uh, something with an engine in it, is going to be zero. We're normally looking at projectiles, things that have been shot with an initial velocity uh, or hit uh, or dropped. Uh, these are things which don't have acceleration um, because there's no external force in the horizontal direction. The only acceleration normally in these, especially the projectile motion, is uh, due to the gravity. Okay, so that means, that, sorry, that the final velocity will always equal the initial velocity. And we can calculate the initial velocity, again, I'll talk through this, is F cos, the angle uh, of launch. Uh, the only component that's shared between the vertical and horizontal uh, parts of motion are time and this is the same in all projectile motion so as I was talking about the uh, monkey hunter problem um, the vertical and horizontal components of the velocity it were independent but the time was the same time is consistent okay when we have a, a force or velocity um, which involves some sort of uh, object being projected at an angle, things become more complex. We know the initial force normally uh, in the direction of the projectile, um, and we often know the velocity in the, project, uh, the direction of the projectile, but this is no use to us. Uh, we can only really apply SUVAT when we've got our um, constant acceleration. So we want to convert this into the horizontal and vertical components. So we take away all the nonsense and we look at the vertical component of the force and the horizontal component of the force. Using trigonometry, we know that the vertical, sorry, the horizontal part of the force is given by cos q, where q is the angle between the horizontal and the force itself, is uh, sorry, cos q times the magnitude of the force gives the horizontal force. And this is the same for velocity. So cos q times velocity is equal to the horizontal component of the velocity. And similarly, if we want to look at the vertical component, 
then this would be sine q times force uh, to give the vertical component of the force and again uh, the velocity uh, in the vertical component would be uh, the velocity of the projectile multiplied by sine q a uh, very quick um, look at why that works uh, it's just simple trigonometry if you have an angle theta sine theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse in this case b over c uh, the cosine would be adjacent over hypotenuse a and c and if you don't know that what the hypotenuse is you use the tangent which is the opposite over the adjacent b over a and we remember this with the rhyme soccer to, uh, or when i was a student uh, we remembered this with a mnemonic shouts of happiness come after having tankards of ale which is uh, awesome uh, of course as i was a student i didn't really know what that meant uh, because i'd never had a tankard of ale so let's now look at an example question and it doesn't matter uh, what the question is at this point normally uh, see that questions will come in these kind of parts um, and these are the steps that you will follow anyway um, they'll ask you uh, what the time taken to hit the ground was you've got to look at the horizontal and vertical components of things so we're going to see that an arrow is fired at 40 degrees with a velocity of 40 meters per second so first we calculate the horizontal component v cos a equals 40 cos 40 which gives you 30.64 meters per second. That's in the horizontal component. The vertical component then should be no surprise that we're going to use sine. So v sine theta, uh, yeah, v sine a, v sine theta is 40 times sine 40, uh, gives, gives you 25.71 meters per second. Now we write our SUVAT down and we look at what we do and don't know. We don't know what the displacement is we're not going to know what the displacement is uh, we know what the initial velocity is in the uh, vertical direction it's 25.71 meters per second we know that it's going to reach zero uh, because it's going to land on the ground and we know that the acceleration is minus 9.81 meters per second squared we don't know what the time is that's what we're trying to calculate now bear in mind that we're firing this arrow up at 40 degrees it's going to go up uh, reach its peak at zero and then it's going to fall again where v is going to be zero again so uh, we use uh, v equals u plus at that's the one we can use because we don't know the displacement and again we're going to substitute in zero is 25.71 plus minus 9.81 times t we then work through this and we end up with a time of 2.62 seconds now we know that that's the time it takes to go from um, from the initial launch up to its peak at uh, zero meters per second it's going to fall again and because the acceleration is the same it's simply going to take twice the time so the actual answer to, for it to hit the ground is going to be 5.24 seconds it's going to take 2.62 seconds to get up to its peak and then 2.62 seconds to get back down again all right so that's now let's look at a slightly more complex uh, example question a tennis player uh, is returning a ball uh, the shot uh, is being returned it is 1.4 meters away from the net and we're returning the shot 0.2 meters above the ground uh, the tennis player she then hits the ball at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal and the ball leaves the racket with a speed of 12 meters per second the question part, part one says show that the ball will clear the net which is 0.9 meters high so the first thing you want to do is visualize this what's going on so one draw a diagram you don't have to draw an accurate tennis ball but here we go you have a net you have the ball at 0.2 meters from the ground uh, it's 1.4 meters away from the net the net is 0.9 meters high and you've hit it at 12 meters per second at an angle of 0.3 uh, sorry 30 degrees uh, two we now uh, know that there's a diagonal velocity we've got to uh, calculate the horizontal and vertical components remembering 
our trigonometry. So the horizontal component, uh, remember, is opposite over adjacent, so it's cos. 12 cos 30 is 10.4 meters per second. That's our initial velocity, the horizontal direction. In, so that should be u, really. Uh, that's a constant, it's a constant speed. Uh, in the uh, vertical direction, it's 12 sine 30, uh, which is 6 meters per second. And that is affected by gravity. Okay, remember that the horizontal, there is going to be no acceleration, so that the velocity is going to be constant. In the vertical direction, we are under the mercy of the massive planet that we live on, and so the ball will drop to the ground. So here are vertical and horizontal components. Okay, then we do the CVAT trick, we list all the variables we know, and we have a look at which equation we should use. So we look at the vertical component to start with. Uh, the displacement, we don't know what the displacement is going to be at the end of this, that's actually what we're trying to find out. Uh, the initial velocity in the vertical direction is 6 meters per second. The final velocity, uh, we don't know what that's going to be. It could still be uh, going up, it could still be going down, who knows. Um, the acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.81 meters per second. And we don't know the time taken. And so what can we do? We've now got a situation where we've got two unknown components. How can we resolve this problem? The two unknown components, we cannot select a SUVAT equation that helps us uh, here. So let's have a look at the horizontal components. The horizontal components then, we know the displacement is 1.4 meters. That's the distance from the ball to the net. We know that the initial velocity in the horizontal component is 10.4 meters per second. We know that the velocity um, at the net, because there's no acceleration, is also going to be 10.4 meters per second. So the acceleration is going to be zero. And we don't know the time. So we can use any of the SUVA equations which involve time to calculate it. So we choose the easiest one and find the time. In fact, we don't really need SUVAT because there's no acceleration. Um, so once we find this, because it's a shared uh, component of the horizontal and vertical um, motion, uh, we can find t uh, in the horizontal direction, the time it takes for the ball to reach the net. We can then plug that back into the uh, vertical components and then we can calculate s. So uh, we've got a steady velocity. So the velocity is simply um, displacement divided by time. And so the time is simply uh, the displacement, 1.4 meters divided by the um, uh, speed, so the velocity, and that gives you 1.4 divided by 10.4, which gives you 0.135 seconds. And now you know all of these components. Because these two are linked, the horizontal and vertical, we now know time there is 0.135 seconds. So now we don't know what uh, S is, we're not going to know what V is, so we use the equation that doesn't have V, which is S equals UT plus a half AT squared, and we plug all the uh, numbers back into there, you're going to end up with uh, displacement is equal to 0.72 meters. Is that larger than 90 centimeters? No, it is not. However, we have to remember that we're striking this ball from 20 centimeters above the ground. So does the 72 centimeters plus the 20 centimeters that we've already hit it from go over the net? And the answer there is yes. It does. Um, 0.2 plus 0.72 is 0.92. That's bigger than 0.9, so it actually clears the net by a good two centimeters. Now we have to remember that this is all theory. The ball, I can't remember the diameter of a tennis ball, but we're going from the center of mass. And so, I don't know, it might just uh, clip the net uh, given the diameter of the ball. I'm pretty sure 
uh, the ball is bigger than four diameter, four centimeters in diameter. But I don't know. Yes, must be. Okay, part two. It says perform suitable calculations to determine whether the ball bounces in play or whether it goes beyond the baseline. The baseline is on the behind the net, 11.9 meters away. So now we're going to do something similar. Um, this diagram is slightly wrong. I apologize. That should be uh, velocity v is 6.0 uh, 6 meters per second, and the velocity in the horizontal should be 10.4. But we can extend this diagram uh, as incorrect as it is, and we can add 11.9 meters to find the baseline. And we can look at the vertical component again. We write down our suvat. Uh, we know that the height, uh, sorry, the displacement uh, from the beginning is minus two, uh, 0 0.2 meters because it's from behind the net. Uh, we're taking the net now as the zero point. The initial velocity in the vertical component is six meters per second. We don't know the final velocity. Uh, and we know the acceleration is minus 9.81 meters per second per second. So we have to use T, which is the shared component. The horizontal component in this case, though, uh, is going to be uh, the displacement. We don't know what that is. That's what we're trying to find. We know the initial velocity is 10.4 meters per second. We know the final velocity is 10.4 meters per second. Uh, what the acceleration is zero. Uh, so what is the time? Um, we can't use suvat here because we don't have an acceleration. The acceleration is zero. So we work out the time for the vertical. So we use s equals ut plus a half at squared. And if we apply a quadratic uh, solution to this, we end up with t being 1.26 seconds because we know what uh, displacement is. We know what uh, u uh, and a are so we calculate the t using a quadratic equation and that gives you 1.26 seconds so now we've got the shared components so 10.4 times 1.26 equals 13.1 meters 13.1 meters larger than 11.9 meters yes it is but do remember that we're starting at 1.4 meters behind the net so we have to take uh, 1.4 meters away from 13.1, and that gives 11.7 uh, meters. Again, this is now 20 centimeters uh, away from the baseline. So the ball bounces in play. The ball, as John McEnroe would say, that ball was in, man. That was quite a dated reference. I do apologize for that. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. That concludes our motion uh, part. As I said, I've put these in a nice handy playlist. This will be uh, it for this playlist. Um, but then if you're watching the mechanics playlist, you'll be seeing another couple of videos, uh, one on momentum and one on something else, which I've forgotten, oh, energy. Um, and what I would like you to do, if you have the book and my uh, year 12 A-level students do, have this book. Uh, what I'd like you to do is do questions one to five on page 31 and questions one to three on page 35. Um, if you have any problems with those, uh, do let me know. My year 12s, please submit that in the normal way through sharing my homework. And uh, I'm going to put up a video of the work solutions uh, after Friday um, so that they cannot cheat. Ha 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 ha. All right, so thanks for watching. Um, stay safe. I'll see you soon.